Welcome to the Renal Research Institute's Frontiers in Kidney Medicine and Biology, where we share knowledge and advances in kidney research with the world. In this episode, we talk with Dr. Richard Weller to discuss whether UV light is a friend or a foe. We also take an in-depth look to unearth whether incident solar UV radiation lowers blood pressure. Welcome to the series Frontiers in Kidney Medicine and Biology, and it's a great pleasure to welcome today Dr. Richard Weller. Thank you, Peter. It's lovely to be here. Dr. Weller, he is a reader in dermatology at the University of Edinburgh, an honorary consultant there. He was trained at various places in the United Kingdom and spent some time abroad like as a research fellow at the Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf, Germany. And um, in his uh, main research uh, is, and that's the one we are talking about today, is about the action of UV light uh, that um, hits the skin and what it does to the cardiovascular system. I think it's kind of unusual, uh, Richard, that the dermatologist would uh, deal with the hemodynamics, with the cardiovascular system, with blood pressure. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your work and what brought you actually to this, um, to this field of uh, research? Yeah, well, I've, I've, I've not ended up where I started, of course, because um, I'm a dermatologist. And actually, what I've got interested in really is the cardiovascular effects of sunshine. Dermatologists obviously have been interested in ultraviolet sunlight, UV radiation for, well, 100 years. And we've really been uh, thinking about it in terms of skin cancer, because, of course, sunlight, UV, is the major environmental risk factor for skin cancer. But really, as, as, a, as a, a resident in training, I got interested in research and in nitric oxide. And this was back in the late 90s when, you know, it was molecule of the year. The Nobel Prize medicine was then awarded to the guys that discovered NO. Really exciting thing. And NO played a part in apoptosis. And we knew that, uh, and I'd shown that um, UV could release um, NO from the skin or that the skin released NO anyway. And we were trying to work out what it did. And um, by knowing that nitric oxide affected apoptosis, I wondered if in some way it might affect skin cancer. Because really, all dermatologists think about, I'm afraid to say, when they think of UV as skin cancer. And as I, and as I hope you'll understand, that is a short-sighted view. So I went off to the research in Germany, as you say, and I was in Pittsburgh for a couple of years. And I was interested in whether nitric oxide might affect your risks of developing skin cancer uh, with UV. Because... UV released nitric oxide and could it affect apoptosis and skin cancer and so on. And I did mouse work, used experiments, uh, tissue culture work, came back to Edinburgh and started to actually move my animal model work into humans. And, and what I found was that really I couldn't replicate the quite clean mouse experiments in human studies. Now, Nitric oxide, which was the focus of my mechanistic research, was initially described as being produced by nitric oxide synthase acting on arginine, and it cleaves NO uh, to leave NO and citrulline. So that work got the, the big prize, the Nobel Prize, for the three founders of the field. And I was doing my experiments by trying to turn off that pathway with nitric oxide synthase antagonists in the skin. And the problem was, however I delivered that nitric oxide synthase antagonist, I couldn't turn off NO release in the skin. And really, I was problem solving my experiments like you do when they don't work. And I spent a couple of years with the grant money going down and the clock running up and the publications not coming out. And you know, I'm, I'm sure lots of us have been there this anxious time. Um, but what we found was that actually there's an alternative means of nitric oxide production in the skin. And what we showed was that the skin contains large stores of NO3 nitrate and NO2 nitrite and nitrosophiles. And um, initially we couldn't really work out what they were doing there until my friend Martin Felish, who's now down in Southampton, published a paper in which he showed that UV radiation 
in the presence of thiol SH groups can actually photochemically reduce NO3 nitrite, nitrate um, to nitrite and NO. So there is a, a novel pathway independent of the nitric oxide synthase pathway by which sunlight can release NO from what had been thought to be a storage, uh, an, an inactive uh, form of NO, nitrate. And then, you know, I was kind of, and it really was one of those eureka moments because I was at a meeting in Bregenz in, on Lake Constance with a bunch of my friends, great NO meeting, my experiments not working, my friends' experiments were working, sitting around over a pint, looking at Lake Constance, and one of these eureka moments, because Martin had got this new pathway, I'd shown the skin contained all this nitrate. Well, hang on, there's nitrate in the skin, there's thiols in the skin, there's UV in the skin. So all the ingredients that can produce NO by this alternative pathway are there in the skin. And I then remembered, before I was a dermatologist, I was a doctor. And, um, and I kind of remembered from medical school days that, of course, blood pressure is lower in summer than winter. Heart disease is lower in summer than winter. When I was a junior doctor doing internal medicine, we used to have these winter bed crises. Your hospital would fill up in winter with patients having myocardial infarctions and so on. And in summer, it was much quieter. Uh, this has been replaced nowadays. We have an all year round bed crisis now in the health service as we reduce beds. But the point is we, we have this cyclical heart disease. So maybe sunlight via this pathway could release nitric oxide um, and it would vasodilate and lower blood pressure. And, and basically it does. We went on and we did the experiments and we showed that sunlight does indeed release nitric oxide from stores in the skin. It does indeed move into the systemic circulation where it vasodilates and lowers blood pressure. So there is a beneficial effect of sunlight on cardiovascular disease. So it's an unusual place for a dermatologist to end up, but I think an important place. Yeah, no, I, I find the story of, um, of your investigation quite interesting, quite remarkable that you actually started with failed experiments and then yeah. you know, found an, a really uh, innovative solution why, why this might have failed and came up with this really, I think, fundamental uh, discovery about the skin as a, as a source of you NO. Know. I mean, uh, when I read the first time about, um, about your work, I was really wondering if the skin would produce enough NO to affect the systemic effect. Um, was this actually a surprise to you or was it kind of clear to you from the very start? The skin actually contains about 10 times as much of these nitrogen oxide stores, nitrate and nitrite, as the circulation. So the skin is, is a huge store. And of course, you know, it's exposed to UV all the time. I mean, there's lots more to be discovered here. We're still working away at it. And I might say I was pleased that my friend and colleague, Christoph Suszczek, from my time working in Germany, really kind of working in parallel with me, um, doing all, sort of complementary experiments, confirmed this. And of course, I then moved on with, so I met some renal physicians in America. I, I don't know if you've, anyway, of, of you, whom you were one, in which we could come and look at the epidemiology of this. And the really interesting thing is, you know, initially I'd shown a mechanism. I'd done mechanistic experiments in human volunteers, which shine some artificial UV at them. We were doing forearm venous plethysmography, so we were cannulating the brachial artery um, to measuring vasodilation in the forearm. And we showed that UV does indeed directly vasodilate the systemic arterial vasculature. And that produces a transient fall in blood pressure. But of course, to have an effect at population level, you need a sustained um, change. And that's when, of course, we did this work, which we published in the Journal of the American Heart Association last year, in which we looked at a third of a million dialysis patients. And I haven't really thought of this before, but the great thing about dialysis patients is that they have their blood pressure measured three times a week, year in, year out. And also, of course, that, the, that Fresenius has these um, 2,000 dialysis centers all around America. 
And that means you can actually get in at an epidemiological level. And because UV varies by year, uh, by time of year, and by location, um, both the wavelengths vary and the intensity of light varies. And also importantly, things like temperature um, you can correct for. Because in the past, dermatologists have grudgingly accepted the fact that, oh, well, yes, blood pressure is lower in summer. Uh, it's probably, I mean, dreadful. It's probably the warmth or vitamin D. Well, we know it's not vitamin D because all this, uh, there's all the um, correlation between high measured levels of vitamin D and less heart disease, less strokes, lower blood pressure. But the interventional studies where you do clinical trials of vitamin D supplementation show there is absolutely no effect of vitamin D on cardiovascular disease. And the Mendelian randomization studies, which have been published, show exactly the same thing. So if you're born with, with an inadequacy of that pathway, you, you don't get increased heart disease. So we know it's not vitamin D. So the other explanation for these seasonal variations um, in, in blood pressure and heart disease has been temperature. So the great thing about the study uh, we did in this huge dialysis cohort was we could correct for temperature because, you know, if you're in Salt Lake City, it's, it's sunny and hot. And if you're in Denver, it's sunny and cool, um, times 2,000 centers. So you can actually take into account that temperature. Uh, and what we showed was that about half that seasonal variation in temperature, uh, in, 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 in blood pressure is temperature related but half of it is still there when you correct for temperature. So that observational epidemiological data of more UV, lower blood pressure, um, independently of temperature, matches up to our mechanistic data in which we show that shining UV um, at people releases NO to the circulation and causes arterial dilatation. So the whole kind of thing hangs together and, I'm, and I've gone on to a, a clinical trial about using UV phototherapy to treat mild hypertension. Um, and I'm just writing it up and um, I'll be submitting it for publication very soon. And watch this space, but it's very exciting and it all hangs together. Yeah, okay, no, I'm very much looking forward to this. I mean, um, Richard, when you talk to your dermatologist colleagues and friends, mm -hmm. I mean, what, what's the reception there? I mean, we, we, we hear year in, year out uh, that about the dangers of UV light. Um, and then comes Dr. Weller and says, no, actually, it's beneficial. The, how do you explain yeah. this trade off to dermatologists, to other colleagues, but also more importantly, I think, how to explain this uh, trade off to the channel public, to the channel population? I might say there's an Atlantic divide here. So colleagues in Europe absolutely get it straight off. It, it, so the skin cancer that matters is melanoma because mm -hmm. that's the skin cancer that kills people, okay? So, so melanoma is, a disease, is, is related to UV. It's commoner in Australia than it is in Britain. But it's, it's intermittent sun exposure, sun exposure, particularly sunburn when you're young. So this amazing stuff, you know, outdoor workers um, have less melanoma than indoor workers. Now, that might be self-selection. You know, maybe if you've got the kind of skin that doesn't burn, you become an outdoor worker. I mean, that's, you know, these observational data, isn't it? Um, but at the same time, um, it is consistent with the idea that it's intermittent sun exposure, which is the problem. Basil, there is no evidence anywhere that increased sunlight exposure correlates with reduced lifespan. In fact, quite the opposite. Fantastic epidemiology from my um, colleague Pelle Lindqvist in Sweden, where they've been looking at things prospective cohort studies in Sweden over the last 30 years. And they show that the more sunlight people have, when you correct for you know, income, social class, smoking, general health, everything else, the more sun exposure, the longer lifespan. And when a dermatologist says to you sunlight is dreadful, ask them to name you one paper, one paper, there are none, um, showing that sun, more sunlight equates with um, reduced lifespan. There are none. And that's completely different from 
smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, poverty, blah, 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 blah. You, you know, you say to a first year medical student, what are the papers showing that more smoking equates with a shorter lifespan? Well, you know, the Framingham study, the Nurses Health study, the Six Sigma study, the about, you know, you can go on and on and on. There are none for sunlight um, and reduced all cause mortality, even though we know it's a risk factor for skin cancer. So people buy that. We know the fact that, um, you know, when you have a basal cell skin cancer diagnosed, these are the commonest, there are more basal cell skin cancers diagnosed in Britain than every other cancer put together. When you have a basal cell skin cancer diagnosed, your actuarial life expectancy goes up. So you leave your dermatologist's consulting room with a longer life expectancy than when you go in when your BCC has been diagnosed. Now, I don't think that's bad news, but that probably makes me a bad dermatologist. I think it makes me a good doctor um, because, you know, all cause mortality really trumps everything else. In America, there is this rigidly anti-sunlight life. And I feel a bit like a kind of an agent runner. I have had emails from several American dermatologists saying, Richard, we, we think your stuff's great. We're really interested in it. I can't say this here in America. And literally, I feel, I feel, you know, I'm terrified the American Academy of Dermatology are going to capture me and torture me and make me reveal the information. I, I feel I'm kind of running these agents in hostile enemy territory because they dare not say it in America. And I think the social reasons for this actually are quite interesting. Because what a lot of my research is showing is that sunlight, like everything else we do, has advantages and disadvantages. As doctors, risk benefit is the core of our being. When I prescribe hydroxychloroquine to one of my patients with cutaneous lupus, I think of the benefits of hydroxychloroquine, reducing the scarring lupus. And I think of the disadvantages, you know, the, the, the eye side effects and so on. With every intervention we do, that is what we do because we are doctors and we deal with risk benefit. And dermatologists have completely lost this with sunlight. And I think, and I've been thinking about why this is. So the people who suffer from UV are white skinned people. OK, I work in Ethiopia a lot. I've been working in Ethiopia every year for the last 12 years. So Ethiopia is at two and a half thousand meters and it's on the equator. We do not see UV induced skin cancer there. I've just been having an email correspondence with a great friend of mine, dermatopathologist there. We don't see UV induced skin cancer there. The people that get skin cancer are white skinned people. The people that get sun aging are white skinned people. UV induced damage is purely a problem with white skinned people. Now, the ben we're finding benefits here, you know, we're finding benefits of UV in terms of cardiovascular benefits. We know about, you know, vitamin D and rickets and bone health. And first of all, I think dermatologists don't see those systemic benefits. And secondly, the whole leadership of the dermatology world, because it's been a European and American specialty, the whole leadership has been white skinned for the last hundred years. And I think it's been unconscious bias. They, people looking like me, I work in Africa, I look at people like me in Africa or Texas or Florida, and I see UV skin cancer. Um, and I don't see the systemic health benefits. And, I'm, and you know, I think we've had this unconscious bias rather than saying there's risks and benefits. And I think if we'd had a more diverse leadership of dermatology, if one of my South Asian colleagues or one of my African colleagues had been there, they wouldn't have said skin cancer is a real problem. They would have said, I never see skin cancer. And I, I think it really reflects, actually, the lack of diversity of the dermatology. Yeah, that's, a, that's a very interesting aspect you bring to the table here. And um, and maybe this, uh, this uh, series on... Uh, Kidney medicine and biology um, helps a little bit to, to address this also and gives you a forum to, to really speak up about this. Now, thinking of interventions, do you foresee that UV lamps will actually become part of the, uh, of the uh, armamentarium to treat high blood pressure? Yeah, this is a... I, 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 go, I, have, to, I have to go kind of carefully here. 
because of course the sunbed industry love me. They're all over me. Would I like to go and give a talk here? Would I like to go and do that? Would I? Um, no, thank. No, I just I, <laughs> I just want to no conflicts here, please. I just want to um, keep away from this. So we know that artificial tanning lamps, UVA lamps, are a significant risk factor for melanoma because it's really very intense UVA. Um, and I am concerned about that, and I think you need proper trial evidence. So yes, we need to consider that. I've just done a clinical trial of using UVA lamps, the results of which we'll publish soon, which I hope will give some hard data on this risk-benefit ratio. And it needs to be assessed by the scientific and medical community, not by anybody else. We are good at data. We are good at saying, you know, I'm an enthusiast. I want cynics to be saying to me, hmm, you know, prove this, because that's how it works. That's good. We need the cynics. Um, I am cautious about this. I have to go quite carefully because I don't want people rushing out and burning themselves. I, I think it is a possibility. I think we need to know more about um, the effective wavelengths. So, for instance, in dermatology, we've really revolutionised um, work coming out of uh, New England, out of, out of Boston um, years back, in which we defined the, the exact wavelengths which are most effective for treating skin disease. So we use 311 nanometer um, lamps to treat psoriasis and eczema. Fantastically effective, incredibly safe, um, because the energy is focused into the really effective wavelengths, you know, the, where the action spectrum curves have got the best the, the best interface least damage most benefit 311 nanometers is a sweet spot it'd be great if we could find such a sweet spot for blood pressure but i think the current lamps out there are too crude and we know they are a risk factor for melanoma and melanoma is the bad one but sunlight you know, the real stuff. We've, we've we evolved living outside in the sunlight. We are evolved to, if like me, you're a North, you know, you're, you're a white skinned person in North Europe. That's what you're evolved to. If you're a South Asian person in India, that's what you're evolved to. You know, we, we have a evolution has given us all these different skin colors, depending on where we've ended up on, on Earth, uh, adapted to different amounts of UV. So, yeah. So, Richard, um, just a, a question around the, the, the future. What kind of uh, developments are you foreseeing? Uh, my understanding is you would want to identify specific wavelengths that may offer this um, the largest uh, benefit over risk ratio. Uh, and do you foresee larger uh, randomized controlled trials? What's, what are your thoughts around that? We did a randomized sham crossover trial. Um, the big problem we had actually was technological because the existing lamps we have through trials and people are, you know, fluorescent bulbs in, they weigh 50 kilos, huge, great lamps, quite difficult to handle, particularly here in Edinburgh because, you know, it's an old city. I, I live in a 200 year old apartment, which is kind of middle, not particularly old here. Um, most people live in 100 year old apartments without lifts. And we said to the uh, courier company delivering these lamps to people for home phototherapy for blood pressure, can you carry this 50 kilo lamp up three flights of stairs? And I won't, for polite society, give the reply, but it was no. So, so you know, the existing technology is difficult. But of course, with LED lamps and new technologies coming in, this is changing rapidly. But it's going to make it much easier to develop practical solutions. Yes, we need to work out the wavelengths that matter. Skin color really matters. You know, it is, as, as we have moved, skin color is what mediates the interaction between sunlight and biology. You know, we have evolved different skin colors around the world to cope with different amounts of UV. That's why we have different skin colors. That's what it does. And, um, and I think we need to be looking quite significantly at the effects of skin colour on response, because that really is what is going to determine it. So we need to look at that. Um, mechanism, um, is, uh, do you exhaust your nitric oxide stores? Are the mechanisms beyond nitric oxide? 
So Anthony Young down at the Institute of Dermatology in London did some nice trials looking at gene expression uh, in people given phototherapy. And he showed that, that UV uh, upregulates and downregulates different cohorts of genes. And actually some of the genes which are regulated are blood pressure control genes. So I think there's mechanisms beyond my nitric oxide one. And I think we need to be looking at those other mechanisms. You know, the problem is we have only focused on the adverse side of sunlight. Yeah. And we just haven't thought about other effects. We've got this entirely one-sided view of this big environmental, this environmental input. So uh, lots to do. And I kind of sometimes feel I'm all on my own. I want other people to get in on doing this. And a dermatologist, you know, I'm a dermatologist and we, we feel we've owned UV. And I, you know, we put a lot of, we put a lot of the groundwork in. I'm terrified that renal physicians might run along and steal all the interesting stuff from us. So, uh, you know, I, yeah. <laughs> I think it'd be good if other people got into yeah. it. it uh, Richard, it reminds me a little bit of the story about the gut microbiota. When, when mm. I started med school, uh, bacteria in the gut were kind of, you mm. know, just the bad side of the... Um, yeah. of the biology and they were and we we were trained how to use antibiotics to destroy them and to clean them and so on and so forth and now now it's it's more than obvious how how vitally important this uh, this uh, compartment is and i i i think that maybe the same will happen with the perception of of uv light now you you actually gave an a, a terrific uh, ted talk on this topic, yeah. and I, I'd really yeah. like to know how was this received? What kind of reactions did you get from the various quarters, be it, be it the interested public, be it, uh, be it colleagues, or um, what, what was the reaction there? Well, well, that was a great experience. And I have to say, I didn't know what a TED Talk was when I was asked to give it. And I, you know, I threw some slides together and I, um, paced up and down for about 20 minutes saying to my wife what I thought I'd say. And it's had 1.3 million hits. Uh, my mother accounts for a million of those, but I mean, there are 300,000 individual hits as well. Yeah, I mean, it's been really well received and it's a great, it was a great means of, I suppose, getting the idea out to the public because you need to sit down and spend 12 minutes on it. Um, it. It is getting out to the dermatology world it, there's a big, you know, there's a kind of problem, but it's a real crossover project. So, you know, it, so here am I, a dermatologist, looking at renal patients, dialysis patients, um, with an environmental input, UV, uh, with a cardiovascular output, blood pressure. You know, what is it? Is it dermatology? Is it renal? Is it cardiovascular? Is it environmental sciences? It's an absolute so I'm kind of outside my tribe and, you know, with dermatology meetings will have a section on UV. Well, they will have three sections on UV. They'll have skin cancer, obviously. They'll have photodermatoses. That's the other rashes caused by sunlight. And they'll have a public health section, which is basically how do you stop people getting in the sunlight? And so I can produce work, which is very highly cited, goes in excellent journals. It's really interesting but there is nowhere for it to fit into a, a dermatology meeting because there, is, there isn't a badged session that fits it. And, you know, who am I to tell cardiologists how to do cardiology or renal physicians how to do renal medicine? You know, it's a kind of, it's a sort of crossover thing, which is why it's exciting and it's why I enjoy it. But it is, yeah, I, just, I just sometimes wish I got a home. You know, I wish I could say, ah, that's the meeting where I'll meet other people doing UV systemic health stuff. And it's such a place doesn't really exist yet. I totally understand your enthusiasm for these areas where intersections happen between, between uh, various fields, because it's my firm belief that's exactly there where progress happens. Progress happens when when science becomes diverse, when we when we see uh, the, these areas of intersection between various disciplines, and that's why, at least from for me personally, it was such a 
such an eye opener to see you talk at the American Society of Nephrology to give an, yeah. a, 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 an invited lecture there and to see you talk at the Renal Research Institute conference a few years ago. So I I really feel that this is the the way to advance to advance the field. So uh, just to wrap this up, I mean, what um, would you give as a in two or three or four sentences as an advice to um, to the general public, to the interested general public, uh, and uh, what uh, what in a few words is really the the essence of her research over the many many years. I know it's a difficult ask, but uh, but yeah, let's give it a shot. Yeah, so look, so I start with my dermatologist hat by saying, don't get sunburn. You know, getting sunburn is bad for you. Don't get sunburn. I think beyond that, honestly, I would just relax a little bit more about it. I, I wouldn't get over anxious about it. You know, don't smoke, take exercise, eat sensibly, don't get sunburn. Um, I, I, there's more to sunlight than just the damage it does. And I, I think we need to be thinking about that risk benefit ratio. But to calculate a risk benefit ratio, we need to know the benefits, not just the risks. And that really applies to sunlight. Uh, Richard, in these days, there is hardly a conversation without COVID. And I don't know, is there actually a COVID aspect uh, to your work? Yeah, so who hasn't thought about COVID and how they can save the world by uh, recalibrating their research? Sure, so there is. Uh, we had a paper published last week, or, you know, that the manuscript is up, accepted by the journal, it's being typeset at the moment. So when COVID cropped up, God, a, a year and a bit ago, it's been a long year, hasn't it? Um, you know, initially, we were thinking respiratory disease, it's going to be behave like flu. And I had kind of early thoughts that, well, it's, I'm not a respiratory physician. But then the data started coming out that actually cardiovascular risk factors, you know, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, significantly increase your risk of dying from COVID. And I thought, well, hang on, you know, some of the work I've been doing is showing that sunlight uh, reduces blood pressure, reduces risk factors for cardiovascular disease, uh, even diabetes. So maybe we're going to have an effect of, um, could there be an effect of UV on COVID deaths? Now, Traditionally, you've kind of waited for seasons, you know, you've, you've watched things cycle, mm -hmm. you know, we have winter flu um, epidemics and all these sort of things. And um, three months into the COVID pandemic, well, that's one season down, you've got to wait another three seasons before you can do anything, except um, Johns Hopkins started their amazing um, collating all of this data around COVID deaths initially in America. Now, of course, America is so big, you've got different amounts of UV falling all over it, exactly the stuff we were doing, Peter, with um, blood pressure. Um, and I got together with uh, one of my colleagues here in Edinburgh, who is a geographer who looks at remote sensing data. And we were able to look at COVID deaths at county level um, in the United States between January and April of last year, 2020. But we could then look at the UV falling there, but we could then do some really quite complex modelling. Because if you're going to die of COVID, a few things have to happen. You have to meet somebody with COVID. Um, you've got to get infected by it. You've got to get sick. You've got to not respond to treatment. And then sadly, some people will die. Now, those, those are all different events um, between being healthy and dying of COVID. And they've all got different things influencing them. So the first thing we had to correct for was your chances of catching COVID. So the first bit of the model we corrected for population density and the proportion of the population with infection. Clearly, if you lived in Manhattan in whenever it was, March 2020, you know, you were bumping into masses of people on the subway with COVID. If you lived in Montana, you know, you see a person a week, they're in their truck, you're on yours. So, you know, entirely different risk factors. So we first of all corrected for population density, number of people and things like that. We then put in a second array of corrections for things that we know affected your risk of dying from COVID. So age, ethnicity, social deprivation, air pollution, lots of factors like that. 
And we then did all sorts of complex modeling, you know, higher order effects, other state level effects, different health systems in different states, different cultural things, whatever. Put it all together. And we could then cross-reference basically UV and COVID deaths. And the other thing we did was we then excluded the counties in America where vitamin D forming UV was forming. So not all sunlight makes vitamin D, mm -hmm. only short wavelength UV makes it. So we basically excluded the 20% of counties which between, where between January and April, there would be vitamin D forms. So we looked at the, what we called counties in there, we called it the vitamin D winter, the 80% of American counties, it's two and a half thousand counties, where vitamin D wouldn't be paid. And we found straight line dose response curve, more UV, less COVID deaths. But we then went and we repeated the study in Italy, and in England. And these were effectively separate studies because the way you collate all of this data in you know, age structures, ethnicity, social deprivation, each, each, you know, Italy and England have different ways of measuring this. All of us measure it, but we measure it in different ways. So effectively, it was three different studies. Each study showed the same thing, more UV, less COVID deaths. Very exciting. It was published Last, well, it was it became you know it was accepted went online last yeah. week, and uh, yeah, so uh, really exciting stuff. So fascinating, really fascinating work, and and I, I hope uh, it helps also to bring, uh, in addition to vaccination, in uh, yeah. the the, yeah. the causalities caused by COVID down in the in the summer in the northern hemisphere. And I th and, and and Peter, you're. Absolutely right. Vaccination. So, so when it, we were kind of deciding, we thought there'd be a fair bit of press interest in it. And before it came out, we had a little kind of chin wag between us working out what should be the key, you know, the, the, the one line, a message. And initially we said vitamin D independent effect, you know, more sunlight, not vitamin. That was our first. However, what was really interesting, unfortunately, the people that picked it up uh, on the Twitter, in the Twitter sphere, are the kind of vaccine denying, don't wear a mask, don't take the vaccine. That whole kind of alternative subculture picked it up. Quite frightening. Mm -hmm. They were saying, oh, look, go in the sunlight, you don't need a mask. So we have switched our message. So whenever I'm talking to someone, I say, get the vaccine, follow your government advice on mask wearing, social distancing, or whatever. Yeah. Sunlight probably helps a bit too. Yeah. So... And it's yeah. not for me. So I think that that's really <laughs> an important message. And and um, but it's so interesting to see that actually being outdoor with social yeah. distancing, uh, yeah. with all those and non pharmacological interventions in place, yeah, yeah. maybe yeah. Uh, may really add to to fighting this pandemic and keeping uh, the, yeah. the, the, the the death rate low. Okay. Thank you so much. I really want to thank you, Dr. Weller, for this wonderful conversation. Um, I personally have learned a lot uh, uh, through us working together over the past years and I have learned a lot through this uh, conversation here. Really, thank you. And I wish you all the best for your future research and uh, stay safe. And I hope that um, your work really helps to bring fields together, because as I said earlier, this is where true innovation, true progress ha uh, happens. So really, thank you. So Peter, thanks. I've, I've loved the conversation and I've loved our work together. So many thanks for this invitation. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for joining the Renal Research Institute for this episode of Frontiers in Kidney Medicine and Biology. We invite you to engage with us on our social media channels and look forward to seeing you again soon for the next episode of Frontiers in Kidney Medicine and Biology.